Hi, everyone. I'm Greg Salmieri in New York City. Uh, joining me shortly will be Ben Bayer from New Orleans. This is episode eight of the Atlas Project, which is an eight-month-long, week-by-week reading group on Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand's novel, in celebration of its 60th anniversary oh. year. Could you turn that off? Thanks. We've got someone listening to us live in the room here with us in New York. And um, we're doing, uh, we've got discussion taking place on Facebook all week. And uh, every Tuesday night, we go live uh, to have a discussion online with a, a group uh, I have with me in New York. Uh, ben Bayer is conferenced in from New Orleans, and we'll see him in a few moments. And then all of you guys who are uh, joining us online, and we are uh, we are able to see your comments. Indeed, uh, Doron is impressed by my haircut, so thank you. Um, so this is our eighth episode, and we are discussing part one, chapter eight, the John Galt line. And this chapter is really, the, the, the book is divided into three parts, and this chapter is really the climax of part one of the book. I mean, so far we've been following uh, a certain kind of miniature story Right. Uh, it, I mean, it seems like a full-scale story, but at, once we zoom out in part two of the book, we'll see it's just one thread in a larger tapestry that is the novel. But the plot so far has been about the building of what's now come to be called the John Galt line. Right. So back in chapter one, Daphne Taggart, who's operating vice president of Taggart Transcontinental Railroad, was thinking about what she could do to save her failing railroad system in a world where the economy is just collapsing and everything seems to be going downhill. And the solution she comes up with is to rebuild a certain one of the lines, the Rio Norte line, which is the line that's servicing the only area of the com country that um, is going through a kind of surge of productive activity. This productive activity centered around the work of Ellis Wyatt, who has revitalized the oil industry in the area. And following on from him, there's just a general economic boom in Colorado it's the one bright point in a kind of country where everything seems to be getting worse. And it's doing no good for Taggart Transcontinental Railroad because their line to Colorado uh, is in a state of disrepair. And so everybody is using a competitor, the, uh, the Phoenix-Durango line. And so Dagny uh, comes up with the plan to reinvigorate, to rebuild the Rio Norte line out of a new alloy designed by Hank Reardon, Reardon Metal. And she's uh, setting to work doing this, and this is the plot of the novel up until this point. Uh, Jim Taggart, her brother, right, connives to get the competition knocked out so that there is no longer any Phoenix Durango line. But that actually makes this harder for uh, Dagny because now it's up to her to save the, now it's up to her to, if she's not finished with this line in time and in a very short time, there won't be any transportation. Uh, to this area of the country, and it will kill the business boom that's going on there. And then she thinks there'll be no hope for the country. So she's originally counting on Colorado and her line to save the railroad. Now she sees it as her job to save Colorado in order to save the railroad. And the metal she's using to build it, Reardon Metal, is a subject of great controversy, as we discussed and saw in Chapter 7. And so to deal with problems that are attendant on that controversy, she... Um, uh, undertook to split off from Tagger Transcontinental and finish this Rio Norte line as an independent venture called the John Galt Line. And in this chapter, Chapter 8, we see that happen. We see the construction and first run of the John Galt Line. So um, uh, she uh, was building this line out of Reardon Metal, of course, and Reardon Metal became very controversial. We discussed this in the last, uh, at our last session. And so to deal with the problems that caused for Tagger Transcontinental, uh, Dagny kind of broke off and is completing this line as an independent venture, the, uh, the John Galt line. And that's what we're seeing happen in this chapter. In this chapter, we see the successful first run of the line, which you know culminates really the kind of action that's been going on. Up until now, this, this novel has been, at least what we've been following, is the story of Dagny building this Rio Norte come John Galt line. And that's what we see get completed in a really ecstatic and interesting scene in this chapter, which is why I say it's the um, climax of this first part. At the same time, we've seen mounting sexual tension between Dagny and Hank Reardon, and we see their relationship culminated in this part of, uh, in this chapter. So it's a climax in, in two senses. 
in the remaining chapters of part one, there's sort of a denouement over the issue of the line. And we start to get introduced more of the themes that we've already seen a bit of, but will become central in parts two and three, where we see this story of Daphne's building this line as fitting into a broader context of what's going on in the world in which she and Reardon and the other characters live. One or two other just quick observations about this, and then I'll tell you what our agenda is today. Um, an interesting feature of Ayn Rand's literary construction is these are, her novels are ideological, philosophical novels. They convey abstract themes. And the way the novels are, work is these themes are primarily demonstrated through the action of the novel, and characters learn them by how they're interacting with one another and what they're observing about themselves and the world that they're in and other people. But there's usually at the climactic scenes of the novels somebody formulating abstractly and in words the points that have up until this point been um, more dramatized and illustrated than spoken. And we get that in various speeches at different points in the novel. We saw some conversations or little speeches up until now. I think at the climax of part one, during this first ride of the John Galt line, you get the equivalent of a philosophical speech in Daphne's reflection while she's on the train. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You'll see in later parts of the novel, the same function is served by explicit, more explicit speeches and, and conversations. So. Most of what we're going to talk about today is the story of Daphne Taggart and the John Galt line, as we see it in this chapter. But there are some other developments in the chapter that aren't directly related to Daphne and the line. They're parts of the, the larger trend of what's going on in the world. And so uh, Ben's going to start us out talking about those developments, which are kind of laced throughout the chapter, and then we'll uh, shift over to talking about, uh, you know, about uh, the building of the line, what's going on as she's building it, uh, how the society's reaction is to it, to the first run itself, and then to some of what happens after the run. But Ben, do you want to start us out on the other developments? Yes, and I, I thought I would also mention the, uh, kind of the point of business that we talked about announcing at the beginning, which you, you forgot about, which is just that uh, for anyone who's interested, you can now uh, watch episodes of the Atlas Project on Ayn Rand, the, the ARI campus, uh, which is at campus.einrand.org if you want to uh, basically follow the progress of your, um, uh, you know, episode washing and uh, uh, divide it up into segments. That's a good place to do that, campus.einrand.org. But yeah, I want to start by the talking about... The section division is, is really a useful thing. You get a little outline of uh, what we've said and you can skip around in it, so that's nice. Uh, and also, everyone knows it's available in other formats, too, for if you want to just listen to audio, you can get it on iTunes and such. But check out Campus. It's a multi-platform project, yes. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk, I'm going to start off by talking about some of the kind of business and political developments in this chapter leading up to the, uh, the successful run of the John Galt line. And I mean, this chapter, you know, you can tell from the title, is kind of centrally focused on that episode, which Greg is gonna talk more about later. And I think it's the part of the chapter that most people remember uh, when they think about this chapter, and for good reasons, because it's a, it's a kind of joyous uh, celebratory section of the chapter. But uh, there's a lot of other things in this chapter that I think are sometimes un unappreciated, perhaps because they don't have quite the same positive valence of that section. And I wanna go over some of them, um, just at least as a preface to talking about kind of the fun stuff later on. Uh, so we start off in the chapter with Eddie meeting the worker that he's met before in the cafeteria. And basically through the conversation or through Eddie's end of the conversation, we get a report about kind of the state of things as they are going at Taggart Transcontinental. And I think it's noteworthy that the very first thing that Eddie tells us and that he tells the worker is that he feels like a fugitive. And that's quite a comment uh, for a chapter that otherwise is remembered for being so positive. And I think it's worth thinking about why he's saying that. I'm, I'll plant this question right now. Why does, Daddy, why does Eddie have this view? And I'm going to give you some data to think about in trying to answer that question. So he tells, he tells the worker about how, you know, now he's responsible for being the vice president of operations, or at least he's responsible for pretending to be the vice president while Dagny's basically still running things, but she's literally phoning it in, uh, though in a, in a good way. Uh, he reports that she is winning her battle to build the John Galt line 
in Colorado. But at the same time, uh, he's concerned about locomotives. What good is building the best line available with Reardon Metal going to be if they don't have locomotives? And he notes that the company they had been relying on to build them, the United Locomotives Work, has recently gone bankrupt. They're counting on somebody named Dwight Sanders, who used to build aircraft, uh, to take over this factory and build the locomotives for, for them. Of course, he had to give up his aircraft business to do that in accordance with the Equalization of Opportunity Bill. And Eddie reports that he's afraid uh, of all of this. Uh, he's afraid of the situation he's encountering. Uh, at one point, he says uh, he doesn't know if he's a clown, an understudy, or just a rotten stooge. At one point, he says he even feels like a murderer. He, he also says, even though he's the one who's kind of taking the orders from Dagny, that it's not that he feels like a stooge for Dagny. He feels like he's a stooge for Jim. And I think this is connected to his idea that he feels like a fugitive. And so I'll go back to that question I planted a moment before. Why does Eddie feel this way? What, what is it about this situation that makes him feel, in particular, not like a stooge for Dagny, because that was sort of the original setup, that was the plan, why does he feel like a stooge for James? And I'll give you some tips and I'll give you some hints if, you, if anybody wants to comment on this. Um, he, at one point he says, why should it be necessary for her to have a stooge? Why are they robbing her of her achievement? Why are they torturing her in return uh, for saving their lives? Why would this amount to being something like J James's stooge? Uh, We've got uh, some hands on that here. Should I come yeah. into them, or do we have anything yeah. on the text chat? All right. Nothing uh, in the chat yet. Okay, well, you could explain uh, by saying it's like that because it was Jim who forced her to do it by this underhanded means, running her own operating department. Mm -hmm. and so, so it's something, something shady. Hmm. Ben? Yeah, that's, I think that's an interesting point. And Harry online uh, also comments that James is able to maintain his position thanks to Eddie's actions. I mean, if, if, uh, it, weren't for, if it weren't for Eddie being, first of all, Dagny's stooge, there wouldn't be a chance that the line would be built and there wouldn't be a chance that uh, Taggart Transcontinental would uh, be able to survive and, and James with it. Now, um, so certainly he's serving James, uh, but why does that make him James's stooge and not Dagny's? Because, I mean, Dagny wants Taggart Transcontinental to go on to and succeed and build this line. So what is it about uh, the whole setup that, that makes, uh, that makes and, and some of this I think we talked about a little bit last week. Uh, what is it about the whole setup? Mohammed? Uh, um, well, Eddie, is, his job is to actually run Taggart Transcontinental while Dagny is gone and people from the outside looking in um, are going to credit the line not falling to Jim. So in a sense, uh, Eddie and by extension Dagny are keeping up Jim's profile as a competent executive when he really isn't. So he could be a stooge in that way. Hmm. Ben? Good. Yeah. Um, he I mean, I think this is something we could talk about more uh, later if we wanted to, but I don't want to dwell on it a whole lot more. Um, I do see a few new comments in the chat. Uh, Skyler says, Eddie's discomfort is a result of Jim's grim shadow. Eddie feels like James is the boss at Taggart, who is all hat and no cattle, <laughs> to make a point on a now popular phrase. I've never heard that phrase, but I like it anyway. Um, and Megan says, could it be that Eddie didn't get the position based on merit, but on unfavorable circumstances. I think there's an element to that too, though uh, if, if, he were, if, if it were that he was doing this only to serve Dagny, I think he wouldn't feel quite as bad about it. Uh, so there's something else about the setup that does make him feel bad. And I'll just close this uh, section with the, follow, the following quotation from page 218 on the, uh, uh, in the standard edition. At one point, Eddie says, there's something guilty and sneaky about the whole place. Guilty and sneaky and dead. Taggart Transcontinental is now like a man who's lost his soul, who's betrayed his soul. Does that remind anybody of anything in an earlier chapter? I wonder. 
while people Sorry. are are thinking about that, let me bring Carrie Ann in. Sure. Addressing the stooge issue that Will and Mohammed were addressing, and that has to do with the fact that Eddie he's laying on more than a stooge. He feels like a murderer because what's going on is that Jim, by his underhanded means and the whole setup, is preying on Dagny. Right? He's sucking the life out of her by draining her of her energy and hard work. So when she's exhausted, it's because people like Jim are, are, are a drag on her, but worse than that, they, would, they are feeding off of her. So it's, it's like he's a vulture, and in that sense, Eddie's helping to facilitate the structure of Jim feeding off of Dagny, and that's what he feels, I think, really disgusting about and is disgusted by. Yeah, yeah uh, good Carrie Ann's point. point is well taken. And, and it is, I, I'll he, remind you all that he does talk about why are they expropriating her achievement, right, Ben, also? Yeah. Yeah, remember what we talked about last week, that, that the terms of the deal here are that she has to build the line, and then uh, she signs it back over to them if it's successful, and she gets nothing from it, and, and was staking everything, and gets nothing special from it. Um, I should also mention just... Uh, I won't say Robert much more about it. Robert mentions that she's the one who suggested those terms. Um, so it's not as though Jim proposed True. that. But uh, nevertheless, if she uh, was building it as her own independent company that was going to continue to be an independent company afterwards, it would be a very different situation. And maybe she could have proposed that instead. You know, It didn't seem like Jim had many options at the time when she made her ultimatum to him. Good. So... Before I move on to the next scene uh, with Reardon, uh, I do want to mention uh, something that happens in the intervening scene with Dagny where we learn that Dwight Sanders quits. And of course, the Eddie has reported to the worker that they're counting on Dwight Sanders at this point. Now, this fact does not get mentioned again for the rest of the chapter. But given the importance that Eddie was talking about, it, it was attached to the significance of that possibly bring this up one more time before the end of our discussion tonight. Um, but let's now talk about, we're just going to skip over the scene uh, where Dagny is in her office. Greg's going to talk about that uh, all by itself in a few minutes. But let's talk about the scene where Reardon is meeting with uh, two people who are buying his minds uh, on account of the passage of the Equalization of Opportunity Bill, both Larkin uh, and Daniger. And um, as we're going through this material, I'd like people to consider whether uh, there's anything we see in Reardon's attitude toward both of these uh, characters, but especially Larkin, that resembles any of the concern that we've seen coming from Eddie uh, in the previous scene. So let's first talk about Larkin. Uh, Larkin, of course, is buying up the ore mines uh, that uh, Reardon has to give up because of the passage of that bill. And he's doing it with money that's, that Reardon has loaned him and that the government has loaned him. Uh, but he's trying to reassure Reardon that, uh, that the, in some sense the mines are still his and wants to reassure him that he'll get the first dibs on, on the ore. Uh, but Reardon kind of rebuffs these reassurances, thinks in fact he doesn't really own these mines anymore, doesn't feel safe, because of it. And at one point, I think this is noteworthy language, says he feels like businesses are setting up stooges whom they control to run the properties extorted from them. Remember that uh, this is a word we've seen earlier in the chapter, and it's, it's kind of an unusual word that I think it's probably not an accident that it's getting used in both of these situations. Now remember that Eddie thought he was a stooge but he wasn't even Dagny's stooge. He wasn't the stooge of the businessman, as uh, as Reardon is saying, uh, people like Larkin are uh, being set up to be in this section, which I think raises the question, um, even Dagny's stooge because he was Jim's. Is Larkin really Reardon's stooge or is is Larkin somebody else's stooge? At this place, at this point, remember that we had wondered at the very beginning when we met Larkin what what he was here for, what he was doing in the story, and we would we, he was at that meeting at the rooftop bar, and uh, we were wondering what role he was going to play in this deal, uh, and we also heard Taggart say that 
he was counting on Larkin's many friendships while one of his friends was Reardon. And here we see, uh, in some sense, Larkin is cashing in on his friendship with Reardon. And he's also and lying to Reardon, and we can see that. That's right. true. Yeah. He says, I don't know who I mean, where this came from. I don't know who, yeah. He doesn't know where the bill came from. So, I mean, if, if Larkin isn't really Reardon stooge in the way that Larkin is claiming that he is, and, and we also know he's lying uh, about other I've lost Ben's signal briefly. But yes, the issue is, you know, we have this idea of people are setting up stooges, that it's a no-win situation setting up these stooges. Uh, Reardon doesn't think he can compete in the situation. And um, when, when people do, like Eddie is in effect a stooge for Dagny, they have the sense that they're not really the stooges for the honorable people they think they are, but that somehow it's the bad guys who are are benefiting from this. Ben seems to be back now. Ben? Yeah, so I was just wondering if, if people had any theories about uh, whose stooge Larkin might really be. And I haven't seen anybody post about it yet. Anybody in New York want to take a shot at it? Do we know anything up until this point about whose uh, purposes Larkin could be serving here, if anyone's, other than Reardon's? Um, from the top somebody, and the bottom, somebody. I would I would think from the top and the bottom scene that it would be Oren Boyle because the references are to Reardon doing what we called earlier ver vertical yeah um, <clears throat> you know vertical integration and Boyle can't get or to mm -hmm. quote unquote make his uh, metal or steel right. and so in in that encounter. I think we now see that's that's who the stooge. And notice that what Reardon wants from from the deal Reardon tried to make with uh, with Larkin that Larkin that Reardon can't enforce is that Larkin will give him first claim on the ore, right? And that's just what if if there was any deal made with Larkin and Boyle, which there must have been since he was at that table, it would be precisely the opposite deal not to give it to him. There's a and uh, people online are saying. Uh, are saying Oren Boyle also. Ben, there was one other one other aspect of this scene that really jumps out to me, which is, mm -hmm. um, I mean, more than who's a stooge of whom, is this issue of um, Larkin wants something from Reardon in this scene, right? Uh, they, they've signed, he's, Reardon signed the papers over, Reardon's ready to be done with it, and Larkin keeps talking and wanting, he wants something to Reardon, and Reardon feels like there's something he's expected to do or give him in this scene, and, and Reardon doesn't know what it is, some act pertaining to mercy, he says, and he doesn't know, and he goes like, why do you keep talking about it? If you want to keep up your end of the bargain, just do it. What, why, there's some unfinished business from Larkin's perspective, and I don't think we're supposed to know exactly what it is, but Larkin's seeking something from Reardon, and you can see that he's hurt when he doesn't give it to him, and uh, and defended, and I just think let's not try to figure out what it is now. But um, Paul says acknowledgement online, so uh, possibly um, trust. Uh, trust says Will. So I mean, we can throw out somewhere and let's think about these, but let's just keep an eye on this because this is a thing we're going to see. Uh, a lot more of people expecting something from Reardon, him trying to figure out what it is. Ben? Right, and I think it's probably noteworthy that whatever it is that Larkin is trying to get from Reardon, that you don't see Daniger trying to get the same thing. And if anything, Daniger is acting on a kind of opposite policy uh, from exactly. Larkin. Unlike Larkin, he's not, he's not looking for, he's not trying to assure uh, Reardon, oh, believe me, believe me, I'm going to give you this uh, coal. In fact, he's he's giving Reardon uh, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, cudgel against him that he can use against him to kind of guarantee that he's going to, because, because part, Lark, uh, sorry, Daniger is giving Reardon this illegal rebate, which is going to put Daniger in more trouble if they find out about it. And so it gives yeah. him an incentive to uh, to make this succeed. 
Um, Doreen says does something it on interesting the- online, Ben. She says that what Larkin wants Reardon to do is convince him that he's convinced Reardon that he's doing him a favor, which is uh, a point Reardon makes about uh, someone else in another scene. It's a no. It's a point that uh, Eddie makes about James in another scene when uh, when James when no when Reardon, Reardon. I thought. Everyone, uh, my my recollection is that Reardon says it to Eddie, and people here are confirming that. But whoever says it to who, yeah. uh, I think Reardon and Eddie agree that mm-hmm. if Reardon uh, dealt with James about the matter that he in fact deals with Eddie about, uh, James would try to do this, make him think he convinced him that he thought, mm-hmm. if you know that I know that you know, but uh, do what Doran said. You're right. I it's it's it weird. Him. He wastes two hours trying to make himself believe that he's made me believe that he's doing me a favor by accepting. Right. Thanks, Will. It's it's weird in speaking about what Eddie uh, is going to have to deal with Jim in regards to, and that's on page two twenty six. If anyone's interested, um, so let's let's talk about that scene. Uh, there's a few things I wanted to bring out about that, though I should also mention in passing, we also find out that Wesley Mouch gets a job at the Bureau of Economic Planning and National Resources. Now, we don't really know what that is. We haven't heard of this agency beforehand, but we know that he's apparently not working for Reardon anymore, and now he's working for uh, the feds. So uh, Eddie goes to meet with Reardon, and I had asked earlier if, uh, if the scene, um, if the passage about Uh, Eddie, thinking that uh, Taggart Transcontinental was dead inside and had lost its soul, had reminded anyone of anything. And somebody online did say it reminded uh, him uh, him or her of the of the oak tree scene, that the oak tree was in uh, was rotten inside and had lost its life force. And of course, Eddie hadn't made the connection at that time. Um, Maybe he's starting to make it more now. And I want to ask another question about a parallel back to the first chapter, chapter with regard to this last scene between Reardon and Eddie. Uh, is there anything here that reminds you of that first chapter? So Eddie goes to meet with Reardon, uh, tells him that he's not going to be able to make payments for the Reardon metal rails on time. And before getting into this meeting, he's thinking to himself about how the city looked as if it had, as if it hid the threat of some malicious unknown a uh, force of some kind. But then when he sees Reardon, when he when the meeting begins and uh, and in particular and uh, sees the way Reardon's dealing with the situation and the amenities of the hotel, this sense of dread starts to vanish. Uh, he starts to see both the city the city and Reardon as ready to swing into action. He's reassured by the sparkling silver and white tablecloth and crushed ice and orange juice that give him a kind of pleasure that he uh, finds unexpected. Uh, is there anything, and, and, and William online, um, uh, or sorry, Pooja says Reardon makes him uh, feel the same as Dagny did in chapter one. Uh, I think that's true. Is there anything similar about the way uh, Eddie is made to feel in chapter one? Remember the way it starts as he's walking down the streets of New York and he's yeah, Eddie the takes city. reassurance in little things like this sometimes, and I think we could see a version of this in in this chapter in his dealing with this. I think it's also in the scene. It's interesting to see the kind of interactions between Eddie and Reardon, um, and there's a kind of real respect for Eddie that Reardon portrays, which I think I think is interesting. But I think we really need to move on now yeah. uh, to the other stuff where we're about twenty minutes behind where we should be. So I want to talk about the um, the moving on to the scene where uh, Dagny is in her office. Now recall how this happened. Um, uh, in the first scene, Eddie is telling the worker about um, various, you know, th- th- these scenes between Eddie and the worker are, uh, at least among other things, a way to kind of recap what's going on with Taggart Transcontinental and uh, a kind of confessional scenes for Eddie. Although it's interesting if you pay attention to the workers' reactions, they're interesting. He seems to be a character in his own right. He tells Eddie he likes the name, the John Galt line, for example, but he doesn't seem happy when he says it, and Eddie's a little confused by that. So there's something interesting to track about this worker relationship. But in any case, Eddie tells him that they're really relying on this Dwight Sanders and tells him about that Daphne has this office, you want to check it out sometime, it's, you know, 
uh, a block away from here or whatever. And so now we know how much Daphne's relying on Dwight Saunders. This is um, mentioned in this next scene. It's the only other time we get it in the chapter. She now comes back to New York because it's just she's heard on the radio that he's quit. Uh, this is now the, the second or third, depending on how you count, time that someone she was relying on for something has quit. And she's come back, and she's in her office. She was trying to maybe uh, get in touch with Sondra, stop him from quitting. She wasn't successful. And she's really defeated. And we've seen this a couple of times, right, where Daphne um, is normally full of life and energy, but the first time is when she's trying to uh, promote Owen Kellogg and... Uh, he, he quits, uh, he uh, leaves the job and won't, won't explain why, and she's d defeated and feels this kind of helplessness. Um, she had this kind of crisis of motivation when the, the contractor she was counting on to finish the Rio Norte line, uh, McNamara, uh, quit, and that's when she went around looking for inspiration and she couldn't find it and she felt like something was moving her. Uh, and now, you know, Saunders has quit, and she's alone in her office, and the loneliness she feels in her office is, uh, starts to seem to her more profound than metaphysical. It's not just that she's alone in her office, maybe alone in the city, maybe alone in the world. Um, she's in this little dilapidated office right across the street from the Taggart building, which she likes. I mean, it's, it's efficient, it's cheap. Uh, she doesn't have to notice where she is, but suddenly the kind of dilapidated surroundings uh, feel more like a trial to her and she's looking up, she's looking out the window, looking up at the Taggart building and she feels like she's separated from it by much more than the pane of glass, the rain and these few feet. Uh, it's described as she's looking up at the unattainable, uh, uh, at an unattainable ideal of everything she loved. So there's a sense that she's really distanced from this. And we got some interesting comments about this uh, in the Facebook group, Meg was noting the kind of extent to which she's lonely, and it's a metaphysical loneliness. Uh, Anna thinks of the Taggart building that she's seeing as a, like a wall that's blocking her vision. I don't understand it that way. I think it's um, it's still serving as the ideal for her. It's just an ideal that she's now thinks she's unable to reach. Um, but um, Anna also likens it to to uh, you know some previous uh, motivational crises that Reardon had and that Daphne had earlier. Um, but what's significant and, and uh, I think in particular, and Anna points it out, is that it's, it's an unattainable ideal now. She now is thinking she won't reach it or she can't reach it or she'll never be able to get it. And she associates it with this image she had as, uh, as a young woman, yes. Uh, uh, Francesca says it's the loneliness of her childhood, right? It's the gray loneliness, it's this helpless, it's the loneliness of her childhood. And recall, we had um, how she felt as a child. There's nobody there worth dealing with, you know, with the exception of Francisco, who comes once a year. There's no, there's no peer. She feels contempt uh, and nothing to look up to. And, um, and this is the loneliness she feels. And she associates it with an image she had from her childhood, Right, an image of a man who stands where the railroad tracks converges and holds them. Uh, that man is associated with the image she had of the child, of the kind of world she wants, what it is she wants out of life. And she now, as Anna says, she doubts she'll find it. And there's another aspect to this, right? Um, she's kind of collapsed in this sort of despair or loneliness on her desk, and she's facing now for the first time a thought that she's long had but never articulated to herself. And that thought is that there's something really missing from her life. She loves her work. She loves the railroad. What's more, she loves her love for these things. But there's another kind of feeling, something that she didn't have. If, you know, um, and let me find it. Um, if emotion is one's response to the things the world has to offer, if she loved the rails, this is on page 220 of the standard version, if she loved the rails, the building and more, if she loved her love for them, there was still one response, the greatest, that she had missed. She thought to find a feeling that would hold as their sum, as their final expression, the purpose of all the things she loved on earth. To find a consciousness like her own, who would be the meaning of her world as she would be of his. No, not Francisco d'Ancona, 
her childhood love who always represented the future to her, right? This down payment on the world she wanted. No, not Francisco d'Anconia, not Hank Reardon, interestingly. It's not quite admitted to herself that she has these kinds of feelings for Hank, but he is the one bright spot in her life, the one kind of tower of competence and a real source of inspiration. So no, not Francisco, not Hank, not any man she had ever met or admired, a man who existed only in her knowledge uh, of her capacity for an emotion she had never felt but would have given her life to experience. This is also interesting because she's noticing now something about herself that she didn't notice before. Um, it's, it's in part this want for a love, right? But it's also she knows in herself that there's a capacity for a feeling that she hasn't had, which is striking because even just in the last chapter, in the scene when she's in Colorado with Reardon and they have this moment of understanding, and I think Pooja, I think online, described it as sounding post-coital, the way she's thinking in this moment. The description is she's in the clarity of having felt everything she could feel. But now we're seeing that she thinks that's, that's not true. She has a capacity for a kind of feeling that hasn't been actualized. She knows there's something more possible to her. Uh, there's this kind of response she could have to a man, and she's not had it. And now she's slumped on the best, and she twisted herself in a slow, faint movement, right? Her breasts pressed to the desk. She felt the longing in her muscles, in the nerves of her body. Is that what you want, she thinks? Is it as simple as that? Is it just that she needs to get laid? Is it just a sexual thing? Is it just this physical thing? But she knows it's not, right? It is a physical response. But she knows that the longing of her body is connected to what? She knew that it was not that simple. There was a link between her love for her work and the desire of her body, as if one gave her the right and the meaning to the other. And this is getting back to this theme that was touched on in the previous chapters, right, of the uh, bum who uh, degrades sex and, and work, Reardon who has a kind of exalted view of his career, uh, at least in some senses he does, but has this uh, degraded view of sex, Dagny sees them as connected, and we're going to see more of that in the first run of the John Colt line. And um, in any case, this is, this is I don't know, just, I think a really fascinating scene. It gives you a lot of perspective into her, into what's been driving her even up to this point, and, uh, and just what's going on, just going on now. Um, and we'll see some of what's raised here resolved in the, in the John Galt line scene. Yeah, Robert. So you could say she wants full mind-body integration, right? That's, that's what she, that's kind of what her ideal is. I think you could say she wants a full integration, but I think it's it's not. I think she has and notices that she has full mind body integration. When she wants something with her mind, she feels the desire in her body. It's not that what she wants is a greater integration of her mind and body that, than she has. At least that's not how she's holding it. I think she's holding it. There's something missing from her life, and uh, it's missing from her spiritual life, and there's a physical thing she wants that she can't have because of that. So I don't think she's conceiving of it that way, although there is a sense when we look at the John Galt line in which I think we will see a way in which she feels her a little bit of disconnect there. Harriet? Uh, I just wanted to say you had alluded to this in connection to this pa wonderful passage you just read on page 220 of the mm -hmm. standard edition that goes back to the scene where she had the clarity uh, the clarity of being beyond emotion when she's standing with Reardon mm -hmm. and, and on page 165 of the mass market edition she and uh, Reardon are standing uh, looking at what they've done so far and she asked the question in her mind what greater intimacy could one share and well there is a greater intimacy right so they have the intimacy of the spiritual connection of the understanding of both being great achievers uh, and here now she's actually going the next intellectual step She's like, now she knows what the next greater stage of intimacy would be, and she's longing for him, whoever he is. Who and would fit this would image that she didn't know she had. Exactly. And so it's, it's significant that she doesn't think it's attainable here. Yes. Right, and, mm -hmm. and Pooja comments on that on, online, um, that she doesn't think it's attainable. Um, and it's also significant that this idea of this man at the end of the railroad tracks 
who's uh, connected to her sexual desire and to this idea of a consciousness that would be like her own, is it's part of a world that she wants, right? What she's feeling when she's in this office, separated from the Taggart building, which is her ideal in the other sense, and also looks like the railroad tracks converging, right, is she doesn't have the world she wants. And this consciousness, this man at the end of the railroad tracks is part, and her desire for him, is part and parcel of this world she wants in her, and her desire for that world. Um, so, uh, Ben, did you have anything you wanted to add on this scene? Yeah, just uh, something we had talked about briefly before. I think it's interesting that when she gets into these kind of slumps, uh, these, this uh, feeling of hopelessness that she has, uh, and this is not the first time that she's gotten into one uh, like this. And the, one of the last ones I remember was the very end of chapter, the very end of chapter one, uh, where she had found out that uh, Owen Kellogg was quitting and felt helplessness for the first time. And here again, Dwight Carson, uh, sorry, Dwight Sanders quits, and uh, she feels again helpless and and, and as if her ideals are unattainable. Is there some connection? It's significant that this is a new experience for her, right? She hadn't ever experienced this before the Owen Kellogg split, uh, quitting. Um, now she's had, you know, a few moments like this, um, and they're they're connected to places where, you know, she had a a plan and a way of proceeding at work, but it's been dashed by um, someone's quitting or retiring or not being available, who she was counting on. And part of what the, the desolateness of her childhood was, was that there weren't around her the kind of people that she wanted. And so it would make sense that she would feel this kind of motivational crisis and feel like she's never made it to the world that she's wanted to make it to from her childhood, uh, where it particularly associated to people that she thought she could count on um, you know, not being available. Even if it's just a business yeah. counting on, it's... Good. So uh, should we move on to the next section about the, the other major obstacle she's facing? Yeah, this let's. Chapter? Okay, uh, which, is, which is public opinion. And we asked a question about this in the, uh, on the Facebook group, um, how it was that various minor characters and uh, anonymous characters were reacting to receiving the, the idea of the John Galt line and a number of people saw there was criticism, um, especially coming from the intellectuals who we've met before, say, at Reardon's party. But it's not just them. Um, there's a whole section, for instance, where we get what people said, and that people said this, people said that, people said it won't stand, people said Reardon is a greedy monster, people said Taggarts have been a band of vultures for generations. At one point, we find that businessmen have done a survey about reared metal to see if the public likes it, and 10,000 people say, no siree, they wouldn't uh, ride on, uh, ride on uh, rails made of the metal uh, or on the John Galt line. People said it, we're then told, uh, because other people said it. Uh, they did not know why it was being said and heard everywhere. They did not give or ask for reasons. Now, of course, we're told at one point that uh, Simon Pritchett, the philosopher, the way he understands this is that, well, reason is a superstition, and Cloud Slagenhop says, well, there's no particular source of public opinion. It's just something that's spontaneously generated. But uh, what I'd like people to now think about is, uh, is there actually a source of public opinion after all? And d does this section of the chapter give us any clues as to what it might be? And I'll, I'll go ahead and mention some of the clues, and I'll be interested to hear what people have to say about it. Um, so as soon as as soon as we have Slagenhop state this view that there is no source of public opinion, we're reminded that Slagenhop is giving this speech on the radio. And uh, we're then told about how Oren Boyle is giving an interview in the magazine saying people shouldn't be used as guinea pigs. And the chief metallurgist of Associated Steel warns about the bridge in a TV program. And Bertrand Scudder invokes uh, this idea that we should never uh, we should always uh, guard against, we should take precaution against the selfishness of businessmen and uh, industrialists 
In the face of uncertainty, he writes this in an article in his magazine, The Future. Balf Eubank and Mort Liddy uh, sponsor a petition uh, to you know, delay the, the line while it is studied for a year. They do this on behalf of somebody called the Committee for Disinterested Citizens. And they're supposed to be above reproach in doing this because they're disinterested. And by the way, they are. I mean, Mort Liddy and Balf Eubank, they're a composer and an author. What do they have to gain by seeing that the John Galt line doesn't get to be built? So, uh, so one and of thing you, don't you might think is, time. sorry, one thing you might think is that, you know, these people are the sources of the public opinion, but also the point you're raising now that um, they're disinterested, they don't have any reason to want to cause this public opinion, might make you think there is something to what Scudder is saying, that there's th some mood has gripped these people too, and they don't know where it came from. Perhaps. I, yeah, I mean, I think there's a question about the interplay here between the intellectuals who are influencing public opinion and this mood that they are gripped by. And Augustina, by the way, um, makes a point about uh, these intellectuals and businessmen being the ones that influenced public opinion. Francisca says there's a kind of collective instinct. So the, which one is it? Is it, is it, uh, is it the, the cultural leaders who are starting this trend or is, are, the, are they appealing to something that the public is already uh, interested in? And um, it is, I think, noteworthy that uh, the reason that we're supposed to take the, uh, this committee seriously is because they're disinterested and all along uh, the, the various thought leaders, so-called, have, have been making comments to the effect that you shouldn't trust somebody who is interested, only trust the people who aren't. They all seem to agree on this basic approach, and of course the intellectuals are sort of amplifying it, um, but there does seem to be some get, kind of approach to source here. I think we get Go more ahead. insight into some of the things that are driving people already in the in chapter nine in the next chapter and then certainly in the other parts of the book so i mean a part of what i think we're, we're meant to be doing in this first part of the book is forming questions and one of the question and not yet having answers to them and one of them is what is driving public meaning clearly there are thought leaders who play an important role here and yet it's not clear whether they're the sources or whether they're amplifying or drawing on something that's already that's already there. Al, did you want to say something on this? But this chapter also gives us examples of exceptions to people whose thoughts are led. <clears throat> and they line up along the track. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good point, Al. That was something you wanted to talk about, I think. Yeah, I mean we find out uh, there's there's all kinds of signs of tension sort of on the surface of public opinion in spite of what the polls are saying and what the thought leaders are saying. Uh, there are insiders who are buying stock in Taggart Transcontinental. Uh, Jim Taggart himself is kind of torn. Uh, while he reacts with glee about rumors of setbacks, he also pleads with Dagny for reassurance that the line is going to get built. But more there's importantly... Among the... Yeah, uh, there's, there's two sides to this. Is the side Al was mentioning it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, more importantly, in spite of the bad publicity... There are, there are people who are reading the few chance stories about the building of this line in the newspapers and taking inspiration uh, from them, uh, looking at the city with a stab of hope, uh, as Eddie has been made to do um, by Reardon's example. And of course, all the while, the shippers are piling up and getting ready uh, for the John Galt line to come online. Uh, but nobody cares about them because they're, they're disinterested. Oh. Not disinterested, yeah. Augustina says that it's, it's people who don't follow the cultural leaders and think for themselves are the ones who get it right and have a positive reaction. And, I mean, to some extent that must be true. But I also think there's an interesting feature where there are a lot of people who, although they agree with the thought leaders, and they too say the things they, that they say and, and they repeat the things that everyone else is repeating about how it's vicious or greedy or whatever, um, there are they still nonetheless find a kind of hope or solace or um, their own problems seem lighter when they see the progress of the line. So it's, it's not only that there were these two types of people, 
the ones who follow the leaders and have a negative view of the line and the ones who uh, are more independent-minded and have a positive view of it, it's a lot of the same people who, though they believe that the line is a bad thing uh, and believe what they're told, nonetheless take some kind of a comforter in it. Yeah, and as as one last uh, data point uh, on this issue, uh, even though the union uh, has threatened to keep its workers uh, from the Tiger Transcontinental trains, we find that when Dagny says, well, I'll let them volunteer, all of the engineers on the line uh, volunteer. So they, they must be thinking for themselves independently of this public opinion for whatever reason uh, as well. Maybe because they know Dagny better, they know the line better, it's a good question as to why that is. Um, I want to say something on this? One of the last things I want Yeah, if I could just say, make one comment. I mean, it, it seems like usually when you have this kind of a PR campaign against something, it's being driven by somebody who stands to gain by having a negative PR campaign. Mm -hmm. I guess in this case, the Orrin Boyle and guys who don't make weird metal might be thinking they want to squash the weird metal so they still have a market for steel. Yeah. But that seems to be not really emphasized. It's almost like this is more of a philosophical thing where people just don't want people to succeed. They don't want something new to be invented and successfully. Is that what she's trying to, to say here? Or, or is, or I mean, is I she think thinking that it's driven by people who have some, some something they want to gain by just squashing I it? I think there's evidence of some of both going on, right? I mean, Oren Boyle himself gives an interview about this, and the chief metallurgist uh, of, of, of Associated Steel or in Boyle's company says, well, you know, it's just because I like kids too much, but I wouldn't uh, let my kids ride on. So it, it's Oren Boyle and his people are, are active here. But the question is, is it just them, or is it something more than that? And that, I think, we don't have enough to know the full answer. But why would Mort Liddy, some kind of crummy composer, be involved? He's not in the employ of... Uh, Unless he was paid off, and uh, as you say, but so far we haven't seen a sign of it. So we should wonder, I think, at this point, why are people like Balf, Eubank, and Mort Liddy in on this? And and I think we'll find more about it as we go. Ben. Yeah, uh, and so one of the last things I want to talk about in this section is is the is the press conference scene. So there's this opposition in public opinion, and it's at some point. I mean, Dagny has been feeling helpless, uh, if, if the latest obstacle that she has to battle is public opinion, I guess she decides try to do what she can to battle that public opinion. And so she gives a press conference. And it's interesting, I think, to note the sorts of things that she concedes to the critics and the sorts of things that she challenges. And so the, she doesn't challenge, and Reardon's along with her on this, she, they don't challenge the allegations about their motives. They don't s deny that they are trying to make a profit. Uh, Reardon even, you know, digs his heels in and says, I'm going to skin the public to the tune of uh, whatever high percentage of um, profit he was going to make. Likewise with, with Dagny. So they're not challenging this claim about their motive. What they are challenging, it sounds like, is the estimation of the motive that has been suggested. And at one point, Dagny says, any industry that does so much and keeps so little should consider itself immoral. So she's saying, yeah, I'm going to make a profit. I expect to make a pile of money on the John Galt line. I will have earned it. Uh, so that's, I think, I was going to say a few of the things, but I think, Greg, in the interest of time, we can skip the rest of them. I was going to say a little bit more about the atmosphere on the day of the first run uh, among the public, but maybe you want to, do you want to include that in your segment? I mean, suffice it to say, the, the atmosphere at Cheyenne Station is, is similar to um, what we've, especially after the press conference, it's, it's similar to what had been the unpronounced trend among uh, hidden silent people they're taking inspiration, and it looks like I've been, no, they're, they're taking inspiration from this, uh, and a big crowd turns out, and Dagny is impressed, and uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I don't, I mean, it's an interesting question why she has this press conference. I don't think it's exactly to battle public opinion, um, although maybe that's a part of it. I mean, she's described, at, 
as if you look at the scene uh, where she tells Dad, uh, Reardon she's going to do it, he laughs and says, no, you're not going to have a press conference. And she says, yes, her voice sounded earnest, but dangerously a bit too earnest. Um, and he says, have a good time. So in some sense, she's... Um, it, it's worth thinking, and, and maybe people can think well, offline, and we can discuss, uh, and we can discuss in the uh, in the um, you know on the Facebook group afterwards how we to understand her motive here. But Greg, we unless do have you her saying when when she tells them they're going to run the train at 100 miles per hour, they say, "How can you run it that fast?" She says, "Well, if it weren't for public opinion, 65 miles 65 miles yeah. an hour would be quite sufficient." So she's uh, and then it's later at the end of the scene. At the end of the chapter, uh, hmm. they ask her, what's your message to the public and why it says, I think she just gave it. Right. So she is definitely trying to communicate something to the public here. Um, and she's taking into account public opinion. But whether it's that she's trying to fight public opinion exactly, I mean, she doesn't need to. She could just run the line and she'll get all her... Pro this conference doesn't help her run the line. I think it's a kind of... She's enjoying throwing her defiance of public opinion in their face rather than fighting it as a means to an end. And what, what I find interesting about the scene at Cheyenne uh, when they're about to leave is that, you know, when she has this press conference, um, most of the reporters are against her and nasty. There's one or two who like her and are trying to get her to soften her line uh, because they think she's, you know, doing herself in by saying this. And uh, But... Um, but it's still mostly an antagonistic press, seemingly at the very beginning at Cheyenne, too. But by the time Cheyenne happened, by the time they get to about to launch the first run, there's a kind of public festive atmosphere. The people who are excited about this great thing happening have sort of come out into the open, and even the reporters get sucked up in it. And so it, it says that... Um, Dagny and Reardon answer their questions, you know, as though they were meant, I forget what word is used, but like sincerely or benevolently. And in time, this became true, and nobody noticed just when it happened. So there, um, I mean, one thing to notice, uh, uh, as I'm going to transition to talking about the first run now, but one thing to notice about the, this aspect of it, this people who, um, this people uh, who I'm looking at the comment, and Will says it's like a mic drop, and um, uh, uh, when they <laughs> they run it, and that's clever. Um, yeah, one thing to notice is is th this reaction of people is significant to Daphne, right? And so, when all of the people volunteer uh, to all of the tavern employees volunteer. Uh, that's a really significant and moving scene for Dagny. And when people cheer, um, she accepts it as a verdict, knowing that the verdict applies, I forget exactly what the phrase is, but to herself and to everyone in the room and more widely, there's a... Th Dagny is someone who has a question, uh, and I think we'll see this more and more, about kind of what is her relationship to other people? Is the world really so desolate of what she wants to find, particularly what she wants to find from other people? Uh, as it often seems to her to be. Uh, what would be the point of running a railroad if it was and there was nobody decent to, to ship things to or ship them from? Not just no people who were great producers, but just like if the world was full of lousy people, what would be the point? And sometimes it feels to her that it is that way and there's this desolate loneliness, but other times it feels like, you know, there are these tremendous people like Wyatt and Daniger and Reardon, but also other people like the people who work for her railroad um, are good guys, you know, and they, they respond to the best things she responds to. And it's, I think, a struggle for Daphne to know there was, it seems like there were two competing visions of the world for her. One, this vision that's embodied by all these people volunteering and by all these people lining up along the track and and um, that one that seems to be there in her triumph where people seems to be one way and yet a lot of the rest of the time people seem to be another way. And it might even be the same people, the people who believe and repeat what's said about the John Galt line and yet are moved by it and stirred by it in a positive way. And I think part of what Daphne is dealing with in this novel is, is how to understand this fact about people. All right, so now we have the, the first 
Yeah, Ben wants to do something else. Yeah, since you mentioned earlier the uh, her need for finding certain kind of people, and and in your discussion of the scene in the office, you mentioned the scene where she's looking for a consciousness of her own. I thought it was worth pointing out that I think the passage that you were talking about later with the crowds at the station. Uh, this is on page. 237 in the standard edition she looked at the crowd and she felt simultaneously astonishment that they should stare at her when this event was so personally her own that no communication about it was possible and a sense of fitness that they should be here that she should that they should want to see it uh, because the sight of an achievement was the greatest gift of a human being could offer to others so she is concerned here with or at least surprised by the fact that other people are seeing her and what she's done um, perhaps uh, I mean for reasons having to do with the dilemma that you were just describing, that on the one hand, she doesn't seem to think anybody ca can see uh, the ideals that she wants to see, but here it is, all of a sudden, they do seem to see it, at least for the while. And they seem to be on the side of the ideals in some way, rather than, because p p what's so striking to her uh, it, in the in the meeting with the Taggart employees, and, and Ellen points out that it's it's not everybody; it's Taggart employees who know her. Although these later scenes that Ben points to at the station is people who don't know her. But is they say you know God damn Jim Taggart or something like that? Right? I forget what yeah, s Jim. to hell with Jim Taggart. Some kind of expletive about him. So it's there's a sense of there's like a Jim Taggart way of being and a Daphne Taggart way of being, and one thing for Daphne is that P. F People seem to not be on her way of being. It seems like it's a Jim Taggart world out there. And so when there's a crowd of people who come to stand with her, and part of the meaning to them of this is to hell with Jim Taggart, this is what life's about. Right? That's really significant to her. Um, and again, it's yeah, I mean, significant the whole city with of Denver is doing a like a ticker tape parade, it looks like, and there's rockets going up from Wyatt Junction. So it's not just people yeah. who know her. This is like right. You get the sense it's, it's a public sentiment. Uh, if, yeah, if it's only the, for the moment. The, the world has got wrapped up in John Galt line fever, right? Um, and yeah, so Ben says, uh, in response to Ellen, Ellen's definitely right about that first scene, that it is Taggart employees who know her, but it's by the time of the Cheyenne uh, event caught on to everyone, and the press conference might have been a part of that, uh, of why that happened. Um, all right, so let's talk about the, the run of the line itself. So um, the physical facts of it, not too much to say, although they are described in, in I think really beautiful detail in the scene. Um, they take the run. They go very quickly. Uh, the bridge does just fine. And, um, and there's a, a crowd of people enthusiastic about it, uh, and, and that's also described in loving detail. But let's think about Dagny's own thoughts while she's on the, the train. And some of them pertain to the public reaction. Uh, she notices the, the, uh, this honor guard um, guarding the train and some other things, and that really touches her. But I think we've said enough about that aspect of it, that of, of it by now. The, the central thing going on um, here that I wanted to comment on, and the thing that makes me think this is like a kind of philosophical summation of the first part of the book, is a, is a, a, a point that were raised in the Facebook discussion by Will, who's, who's with us, and by Anna especially, and some other people uh, contributed to this as well. Um, Will says that um, uh, her experience of the train uh, refutes any kind of dualism of body and spirit. That was the phrase you used. And we, we had, um, as Anna points out, this kind of dualism of body and spirit um, preached in Chapter 7, especially by the bum in the diner, and also in different ways by, by Stadler and Ben Neely. Um, and, um, and Ben, you know, drew up the connections between those things last week. Uh, on the Ben Neely side of it, Ben Neely wasn't bemoaning mankind like Stadler and the bum was. He was just saying, you know, muscles. Muscles are awesome. You could build anything with muscles. Muscles are all it takes. And part of what Daphne's thinking is, this is an awesome experience, and it's awesome that my engineer, by little motions of his muscles, can control the train, but it's not his muscles that made that possible, uh, and it's not the muscles of the guys who put the rails there. It's something else. Something else made it possible for people to... 
uh, use their muscles to lay the track in this way, and for this guy to use these little motions of his muscles to move the train. Uh, and of course, even for the engineer, he's intelligent and thoughtful. It's not really, even if we just focus on this one guy, the muscles in his hands, but the concentration of his mind, right? And the, the concentration and the con concentrated ease that the, the engineer has is, is described. Um, so the, the role of the mind in achievements like this, in, it's what makes them possible, not just muscles, is one big theme. But the, I think, bigger theme that more of it is stressed on than the point that differentiates Dabney's view from Ben Neely's is the, the issues that differentiate Dabney from the bum, right? So the bum says, the bum is on about the distinction between spirit and, uh, and body, right? Spirit and our animal natures. Um, which he degrades, right? There's no spirit involved in manufacturing or in sex, and yet these are man's only concerns. He doesn't have any higher faculties, just an ignoble cunning for making inner spring mattresses and so forth. This is the kind of thing that we see earlier. And Daphne, you know, when she hears the bomb, doesn't believe it. This isn't Daphne's view. But something about the experience of the train puts the opposite view, which she herself holds, in much sharper connection for her. And um, why? Well, a few things. First of all, she's experiencing tremendous pleasure. And I think it's, she's really focused on the physicality of the pleasure she's experiencing. So the wind in her hair, the pleasure of that motion, it's a physical sensation that she's finding pleasant. But she's thinking of what, made that sensation possible in this moment and how that fact about it is what makes it pleasant to her in the way it is. It's not just that, you know, wind can feel nice in your hair, but that just would feel kind of nice. This doesn't just feel kind of nice. It's a, it's a tremendous joy and exaltation that she's taking in the physical experience of this motion. Why? Well, because of what it is that this motion is. It's the motion of this train down this line which she built following her judgment. So it's what causes it and gives it meaning. And so that's a big part of it. And that's why she's saying, is this, is this what they call a low degrading pleasure of the body? This thing that is a physical sensation of the wind through her hair and the, the motion you know, of her body through space. And also this mechanical accomplishment, this machine that um, the bum would say is like an inner spring mattress and an ignoble cunning. And of course, its, its purpose is to you know, move oil around and, and things that are going to lead to gadgets and food and machinery and remember what it was that prompted the bum to say this to her. Uh, she was looking at this toaster right, from Marsh Electrics in Colorado that she thought was ingenious and how great it is that we could have toasters like this and all these kind of things. But oh my God, if Colorado goes it's all going to go, and now she's safe in Colorado. And the bum thought that that, all the machinery and devices, all of which, you know, get you nicely toasted toast and all the other creature comforts of life, um, that's, you know, that's what it's all about, to fill up your belly and have toast. And for Dagny, the, what's pleasant about the toast and gives it meaning is not just that it feeds you, but it's been come up with in this ingenious way and created. Uh, and created by, uh, by this. And so she's having this experience, and she's owning and endorsing this experience, and owning it as distinct fr and opposite to the, to the bum's view. And there's some more to say about this. But ben wants to break in on this point. Ben? Yeah, so, I mean, you, you mentioned, that, and, and several people online have mentioned that in, in articulating this view to herself, she's repudiating the view of Ben Neely and of the bum and, you know, people like Stadler. Even. Particularly the but, bum. Yeah. But it's not just that. There's, there's an important contrast, I think, even between her own thoughts earlier in this chapter and, and presently. Uh, earlier in the chapter when she was yes. in her office, remember, she said, is that what you want? Is it as simple as that? So she's at least tempted by the idea that it's a low physical pleasure. Now, she immediately sort of... Immediately steps back from afterwards, that she, she says, knows it's not. Right. right. Well, she says 
there's some unbreakable link between her love for her work and the desire of her body, but it's she hasn't specified yet the nature of the link, and it gets. She says a lot one more gives meaning to the other, right? One gives her the right and the meaning to the other. So, I think at, at some level she has the content of the link there, but I think you're definitely right that there's something she doesn't have about the link, and. Um, and Robert had suggested earlier that there's some way in which she's longing for a mind-body integration here that she doesn't have. And here's one thing that she doesn't have. She has a, a really big gap at this point between her, de this point when she's in the office and feeling this way, between her desires and their fulfillment, right? What she's yeah. looking up at the unattainable form of everything she loves. So there's this tremendous gulf between what she wants and what she has, and between yeah, what correct. she wants her life to be like. So it's not just, I don't have a particular thing I want, but from the world she wants and the world she inhabits, from what she wants her life to be and what the hours and days of her life actually are. And the place where she explicitly comments on spirit and body on the train is in connection with noticing how fast the train is going. And with it rushing forward at this great speed, there's, it, everything is foreshortened. Foreshortened the distance, the time between vision and touch, between something being in the distance and it being there, between sight and the, the, the presence of a thing. And then it clicks to her between mind, between spirit and body. First the vision of the thing and then the motion to achieve it, to get it. And so this, um, this speeding forward of this train, which train ride is the thing she's been working to achieve for this whole book up until this point, and now has achieved. And the, the speed of the train now in this context serves for her as a metaphor to, you can get what you want. You can achieve the world you want. You can achieve your values. It's not some ideal that's off in the distance that you can get. You can have it in the moments of your life. And then think about when we first meet her. Right? We first meet her on another train, hearing in her head, because based on, you know, orchestrated based on hearing somebody whistle it, this piece of music, which um, we're told is Halley Swift's concerto, although it couldn't be because he didn't write one, but it, Halley Swift's concerto, which um, speaks of the rising and is the rising itself. And she says, this is why the wheels have to be kept moving, and this is where they're going. And now here, on this run of the John Galt line, where she's feeling this tight integration of spirit and, uh, and, and body, of what she wants her life to be and actually bringing it into reality in the life, this is when she hears this music again in her head, as though it were written for this. This is the music that stands for um, bringing your values into reality, achieving them, living your values. And we saw this in contrast to Halley's fourth concerto, which is this music that's um, focused on the difference between what people like Daphne want out of life and what they actually are living in, and why is there this gulf? And she hears that music sometimes. But this is this fifth concerto that promises a resolution to this conflict. And it's a resolution that she feels while she's on this train. Um, and of course, the other other big element of what she's feeling on this train, the other big element of this feeling of unity of spirit and body, is she's thinking about whose mind, whose spirit, who is it that made this happen, and she finds herself looking too much at Hank, and looking at you know his shirt's a little bit open and you can see a bit of his chest and the way he's standing and so forth, and um, there's a real heightening of this. Uh, uh, sexual tension, and she's then very aware of him looking at her in a way that's cut off from future connections because it's it's um, very present and in the moment, and she's over. Well, we'll talk about the the sexual aspect of it a little more in a few minutes. One other aspect that I want to just highlight about about this scene, and then I'll see also if Ben, if you have anything you want to to add that I, I haven't hit, uh, and and also we should be looking at the people. Uh, online, uh, William Wirt says it's it's flow, uh, and I think that's that's. Uh, I mean, this concept of flow that you get in pop psychology literature is a bit vague in some ways, but I think yeah, this is the kind of state that it's it's getting at, and it's a real state of being kind of in the moment and all systems going. Um, 
the other connection is, is Jackman we've seen has this tremendous love for machines and this likening of machines to living things. And we get some really beautiful descriptions of that here. It's not just an analogy, so he thinks the machines really are alive. And Carrie Ann, do you want to comment on this point? Actually, I love these two paragraphs that begin with they are alive. That's what um, I, the ones I was thinking of too. Go ahead, read them. Yeah, on pages 234 to 35 of the Mass Market edition. So you're, you've been describing very beautifully how she's getting the power of the mind in a, when you're living in a world that make that where you can bring your ideas into fruition. Mm -hmm. You can think of something desired and achieve it with an immediacy. But then there's also the flip side that she realizes in the second paragraph on They Are Alive, when she's fascinated by the way machinery works and she loves the beauty of it. She's also realizing, and there's a very important sentence in that second paragraph that begins, they are alive. She says, should the soul vanish from the earth, the motors would stop because that is the power which keeps them going. Ellipses, the power of a living mind, the power of thought and choice and purpose. So she's not only experiencing the immediate connection between thought and action, desire and achievement in that direction, but she's realizing at the same time that without that, everything screeches to a halt. Mm. And of course, she's seen examples of this creature. Yeah. We have earlier, she was at a factory where uh, rusting a rusting machine that he had this horrible reaction to. She knows that that's something that's possible, right? So yeah, so there's this tremendous likening of machines to living things. It's not just a likeness. They actually are alive. In what sense are they alive? Well, they're parts of the lives of people people with a certain kind of mind who created the machines, who are making the machines keep on running, and whose lives the machines are serving. And if those people weren't there, if those minds weren't there, if the machines fell out of that connection, mm -hmm. it would be like that machine she saw rusting. Exactly. And this is why, it, and it's an extension of the self, which is why in the previous chapter, when we were discussing it last week, both places where Dagny and Hank were talking about ownership, Hank with Reared Metal and Dagny with Mm -hmm. you know, damn, damn straight Jim, that's my, uh -huh. my train line. They both got this very visceral reaction of they're defending their lives. They would mm -hmm. be willing to kill for it. Yeah. And here we get, we see why, because if these machines are an extension of you, mm -hmm. they're your soul brought to life as an extension, then you will defend it with your life because it is part of you. So I think that there's that extension of self through your creation. There's, yeah, there's also another interesting element of ownership in this scene, right? So we're talking about Dagny's reaction, but there's also Reardon's reaction. Da Reardon is not interested in the crowds by the side of the track, right? He, he would brush aside any consideration such as they like it when he's so focused on it works. And he's looking at the rails, and she says, you know, if you ever want to see ownership, it's what he's got. And then, of course, he looks at her in the same way. So uh, you said, uh, Will, foreshadowing uh, on the Facebook, and it's not too long you have to get to what's foreshadowed in this case. Um, one other thing about her reflection on the motors uh, I thought we should mention, uh, and Ben, you might have some thoughts on this, is the, um, the idea that they're like a moral code, I thought was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and in particular, the way that she uh, illustrates that is that every part of the motors was an embodied answer to why and what for, like the steps of a life course chosen by the sort of mind she worshipped. Well, by now, I hope people remember that the what for question is, uh, we've heard this somewhere before, it's it's uh, Francisco's favorite question. And, and Francisco has also used, has used it in, you know, in connection with his views on morality. Uh, there's an undercurrent about morality in this chapter because they, she and Reardon have been criticized for being immoral. She is, uh, she is uh, uh, challenging that both by the press conference and the very act of uh, running the line. Um, and we're getting a better view of what that's all about. And it connects somehow to the to the soul vanishing from the earth. The motors would stop. Uh, the soul is what provides the what for, right? The soul is what provides. Because if you think about the the where she sees the connection of spirit and body, the spirit side is the having a vision of what's possible, 
And when I say we should think about this first part as, as raising questions, there's a question that's raised immediately by that. Whose malevolent has crept through the world trying to tear those two things apart? That's a question we maybe shouldn't try to answer yet, but um, there's some reason, something that's torn them apart, such that for much of her life, she's sitting in an office staring at the unattainable form of her ideal. All right, well, let's move on from this, this scene. And Ben, I think we can, because we had some tech problems starting up, we could go maybe five minutes a little bit over, um, But because there are two other scenes we want to talk about. Uh, and do you want to take us through the, um, the first of those, the immediate aftermath of the, yeah. of the train? I'll try to do the shorter version of this. So we had posted a question online about uh, Wyatt's toast uh, at the end of the chapter. He raises a toast to the world as it seems to be right now. Uh, and we were asking people what, what he meant by that. How does the world seem to be? Uh, why does he then go ahead and throw his glass into the wall in an act of anger? Uh, as if to suggest that it won't really last. Well, he, he actually says this, never mind, we'll try to think that it will last. And he's being, you know, kind of sarcastic. In spite of all of the optimism that both he and others in the chapter have expressed uh, over the course of the chapter, I mean, he said he's going to, you know, open up his shale oil uh, business. He's going to make Colorado the capital of the second renaissance. Reardon counters, no, he'll make Pennsylvania the capital. Dagny tries to one-up them both by saying she's going to have a whole transcontinental railroad of Reardon metal. And then uh, Wyatt sort of uh, has this outburst. Never mind, we'll try to think that it will last. And the question here is why does he, why does he feel this way? And why does he react this way in spite of uh, all the optimism. And we did get a few comments on the Facebook group about what could be accounting for this um, uh, disparity. Uh, why on the one hand do they feel optimistic, but then later he at least doesn't seem to. Uh, Skylar online said at the moment they seem to celebrate their accomplishments. Uh, this seemingly contradictory scene shows the juxtaposition of victory over nature, but still realizing that the rest of the planet is in distress and, dis and disrepair. I think that's right. And Will also, you know, trying to explain what might still be wrong with the world, the way in which the planet's in dis distress and disrepair, says they've been talking as though the equaliz Equalization of Opportunity Act, the anti-doggy dog rule, and the other status crony machinations did not exist. The promise of more on the way. And one way we might, uh, reframe this here is, well, why think that more are on the way at this point when the public seems to have accepted this achievement uh, to such fanfare? Uh, isn't the public now going to be on their side? Haven't they, aren't they all yeah. getting on the bandwagon as, as Wyatt has initially We're the band. It? We're the band. So what reason is there to think that the, they're going to, jump off the bandwagon and uh, we're starting to get some uh, comments online. William mentions a number of philosophers' names. Uh, they're not mentioned in the maybe book. Maybe as but, the people um, whose malevolence is trying to tear, tear spirit and body apart, maybe, is what William meant. Maybe so. And we have talked about, yeah. about the role of... And the another role. William says, maybe they're not existing towards the public opinion. What, what did you say? Go ahead. Uh, our Will, who's here with us, uh, a different Will than is posting online, suggests that the philosophers might also be the source of public opinion that we mentioned earlier. Well, yeah. No, we, do we, go on. We ask this question of what is it that's molding public opinion here? Is it these, is it these intellectuals uh, or are the intellectuals amplifying something else? Uh, and there have been these philosophical questions about the nature of morality uh, that have been uh, tossed back and forth in this chapter. Um, this this could be part some of, of the, the issue things, here. Some of the things that, that must give um, Wyatt the, the reason to think that things won't, uh, won't continue going well are the very ones, Ben, you, you brought up earlier in the earlier section and that people have mentioned the equalization bill and so forth. It, it's worth thinking about these three characters, though, Wyatt, Daphne, and Reardon, how they process these things because they don't all process them in the same way, right? Wyatt's tendency is to um, think that he, he has a sense that there's a pattern in the world of people 
pouncing on the best people, the people who are most productive, kind of draining them, uh, and then once they're dead, move, once they're, they've been drained, moving on to the next corpse to drain. And that's what he thinks Tacker Transcontinental is trying to do to him, right, when he comes into Daphne's office at the beginning. And he's angry about it, right? He's really hostile and angry, and he thinks that this is what you people do, people of the world. You victimize and pounce on people because they're good, and then you, uh, and then you expect you know, there to be another corpse to feed you afterwards. Maybe that's the perspective that Eddie's kind of grasping part of yeah. the time when he's with the worker. So that's that's Wyatt's and, perspective. And Reardon's it's noteworthy and that Daphne's are a little different. That it's noteworthy that Wyatt hasn't changed his mind about that at all, even even when we first meet him, because he says, uh, or she says, you were right, Ellis, and he says, I was right about everybody except for you, Daphne. So he's 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 still maintaining his view that the world is is filled with these kinds of vultures, and Daphne is the rare exception. But he is just. He doesn't want to live, and he doesn't want to live around other. He lives way off in the no middle of nowhere. The kind of people who want to see him on business, he's got a guest room for, and he wants to be as far away from everybody else as possible. And he's, you know, see so his default way of of being, or anyway, the way he is most of the time, is with this kind of his guard up, uh, bitter and angry about the world, and he thinks they're out to get him, and. Uh, and, you know, with some reason. And he's going to fight back. And he's, um, in this moment where he's being so super optimistic, right, he's really caught off guard. He doesn't even uh, introduce himself to Reardon, who he's never met in person, until way into the car. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I haven't told you who I am. And, uh, and Reardon says, yeah, well, I, I've guessed by now. And I, I've always wanted to know what you're like. And Wyatt says, yeah, I never get to be how I'm like. So... Wyatt thinks this enthusiastic, excited version of himself is his real self, but it's a way that he isn't ever, right? And because he has some view of what the world is like or what people are like, that means that you can't be this way. Reardon doesn't, right? Reardon's different than that. Um, Reardon's characteristic view is this kind of lunacy is going to fade. It's, it's impossible. It's not going to work. Uh, once we complete the, the Rio Norte line, Dan Conway will be back, the rest of them. All of this is temporary. And we see it getting harder and harder for Reardon to maintain that view. Uh, so he feels this kind of hatred for the first time in that scene with Paul Larkin, Ben, that you were discussing earlier. We didn't have time to pose about it. He feels hatred, and he feels attacks of hatred now in the wake of the passage of the Equalization of Opportunity Bill. But he eventually comes to be able to master them and to, and, 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 and to say, well, look, that's not what life's really about. And, uh, and, and now in the wake of the success of the John Colt line, I think he's back to his normal way of thinking, which is, this is temporary. They're not going to keep up with this. We've proved so well uh, that our way is right, and uh, there's going to be a turnabout. <clears throat> One last thing I'll say, Greg, before we go to your, your last section, is that you know, this is not something that is motivating uh, Wyatt, because I don't think he knows about it necessarily. But if we're, if we're talking generally about, well, what is still, what's the other shoe left to drop? What's still left that can go wrong? And it is something that Dagny should know about is, well, the, again, the thing that wasn't talked about over the rest of the chapter that happened at the beginning, that Dwight, Dwight Sanders quit. And remember that Eddie said, Reardon Metal Rail will be the greatest track ever built, but what will be the use if we don't have any engines powerful enough to take advantage of it? And here then at the yeah. end of the chapter, we have Dagny saying, if the, you know, should the soul vanish from the earth, the motors would stop. And well, whose soul just seems to have vanished? Dwight Sanders at the very least. So that's that's a big uh, lacuna. As the, uh, we're waiting to see how is, is that going to get filled somehow. I don't hear you, Greg. Sorry, I haven't put my mic back on. We're 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 at time, but I said we should go a little bit later because we had some tech difficulties. So we'll go five or ten more minutes, and let's just talk about the other shoe that drops in the chapter. Um, indeed, literally. Um, I suppose, uh, which is the the sex scene at the end. So, Ben, what was the question we had asked people about this scene? It was, um, what were, what does it mean to Dagny, and what indications are there of what it means to to Reardon? Yeah. Um, 
and we got some some I think good answers to this on both on both counts. Um, we get uh, um, Harry uh, Harry M uh, gave us a lot of really good quotes. I'll just read one or two of them that that illustrate it. Um, the course led them to the moment when an answer to one's highest values, in admiration not to be expressed by any other form of tribute, one's spirit makes one's body become the tribute, recasting it as proof, as sanction, as reward, into a single sensation of such intensity of joy that no other sanction of one's existence is necessary. That's from page 237, I think, of the standard edition. And we can see this. I mean, Dagny recall after her first time having sex with Francisco at, at 17, thought of the times when there was something she wanted to express, right, a kind of love for herself and existence and didn't know the way to do it, and now she, the act she's learned was the way. While she's riding in the cab of the John Galt line, she has this tremendous kind of metaphysical feeling, this feeling of this is what life's about, this is the spirit body unity. And then there's a moment, uh, even in that scene in the cab, where she thinks she wishes there was a way, some way to express this. And then she sees Reardon standing there, and I think, you know, you should know what's going to happen that night from, from that moment. That's the, when it really heats up. And so that's that's what this means for Dagny. For Dagny, this ride is about the world I want is possible. Uh, it's not like it seemed to me to be in my office at the beginning. Um, the world I want, what I want out of life is possible. The spirit and the body are related intimately. They're one, both in the fact that the ambitions of the spirit can be achieved in your life, in physical terms in your life, by building a railroad, by getting to where you think you can go, and also that they, the, the joy of them can be experienced in physical terms, uh, in the sensation of the motion while you're in the train, which feels to you not just like a nice tingling in your hair or something, but like something profound and meaningful because you know what it took to make it and what that sensation is going to contribute to your life or what the thing that you're sensing that way is going to contribute to your life. And likewise, sex is a part of that. Sex is something that... Um, um, is your body becoming a tribute or a vehicle of tribute uh, by which you can experience your highest values and uh, that you can do that with someone because they're someone who shares your values. And so she thinks this being with Hank is the kind of obviously right and how the journey had to end. Um, but Ben, what about, you, you really stressed uh, in interacting with people online uh, the issue of what's Hank's side of this. And we, we don't get it narrated from Hank's perspective, but I think we see some things that give us some indication of his sides of it. And some people brought him up. Do you want to comment on those? Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of... I mean, Dagny's kind of reading everything that he does in the best possible light, probably projecting a bit of her own view about mind and body onto him, but, but nonetheless, in the kind of physical description we get of the way that the scene breaks down... I mean, we see his eyes are blurred, their lower lids swollen and raised, uh, res with their glance intent with what resemble hatred and pain. And of course, it's like an act of hatred, like the cutting blow of a lash encircling her body. This something about this whole scene is is painful to him. Uh, and there, there's any number of issues that could be uh, in play here. We are going to find out more, I presume, in the in the next chapter. Uh, the morning after, but uh, you know, one of them is the obvious one, which is, a number of people have raised questions about, in particular on the spoilers group, I think, about how he's cheating. I mean, he's uh, he's he's an adulterer. He's married, and he's he's now breaking his vow uh, to his wife. Uh, that that's one issue. There there might be others. We've 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 heard more about Reardon's views about sex earlier. They don't seem to be quite like Dagny's. Uh, but I don't think we need to discuss that more because we're going to talk about it next chapter. Yeah, just one or two observations um, about this. So I think a lot of people are interested in talking about the adultery and fidelity issues. And I think we'll start talking about them more in, in next session when we see Reardon's own perspective on this, but I think we'll, we'll probably have a lot of discussion about that online. I'd like to have that. So we'll open up a question for people to comment on that. And Will, you've already started that a little bit. 
uh, this week, and I think, and you put a link to an interesting video about it, and we'll we'll have some more discussion online. But let's not pursue that right now. Uh, here, one interesting thing about about it, um, there are hints, um, and this is also uh, Harry M. in his post quotes um, that uh, a quote there's an, about there being quote an incredul an incredulous anger within him uh, whenever she does anything that indicates her desire for him, yet she also grasped that no gesture would satisfy his greed for every evidence of her desire. And I think we know enough to see why this would be there. An incredulous anger, and yet a greed for every evidence of her desire, because we already saw uh, he thinks that you know there's such a thing as a pure woman, um, that this is how women should be. And in the, the end of chapter 7, their last scene together there, where he's in the office with her and she says, you know, Hank, you've never you've always, never thought I wasn't a man. And he's thinking, haven't I? Haven't? Isn't that all I've been thinking when I've been with you? He has this view of, you know, you thought it was so safe in my office, but I wanted to do this to you and that to you, and you couldn't, you know, these things are not to be done to you, you who's above all of this, you who would never stoop to this kind of desire. So he, there's an, I think you can infer that there's an incredulity, oh my God, Daphne wants to have sex, how could that be? And an anger about it, no, that can't be, that's evil, that's wrong, and I'm wrong for wanting her and bringing her to this, and yet, you know, he has an insatiable greed for every evidence of this because he really wants her to be like this and hates himself and her for wanting it. So I think you can see why he'd have those feelings from what we already know about him. And there's one other aspect of this scene that, uh, and maybe this can be our, our, last, our last point, and we're just about the amount over I thought we should be, um, how he looks. I think the description of, uh, of his look is really interesting. The look she saw in his face, this is on page 251, made her know for the first time that she had known this would be the end of the journey. That look was not as men are taught to represent it. Right? This is the look of being turned on, right? of wanting her. That look was not how men are taught to represent it. It was not a matter of loose lips, uh, of loose muscles, hanging lips, and mindless hunger. The lines of his face were full t pulled tight, giving it a peculiar purity, a sharp precision of form, making it clean and young. His mouth was taut, the lips faintly drawn inward, stressing the outline of its shape. Only his eyes were blurred, their lower lids swollen and raised, their glance intent with that which resembled hatred and pain. And the hatred and pain part is part of this conflict I think we've been talking about, or at least it's some indication of that. But it's interesting that part of this integration of mind and body, the spirit and body, mind or spirit, I mean, exactly how those are related to the integration of spirit and body, that there's something wrong in the world's beliefs as represented maybe by this bum and maybe somewhat by Reardon uh, about sexuality is that there's something wrong in how we're taught to portray or represent even the look of being turned on. Um, and I don't know, I think that's just a really interesting literary literary touch, so I'll leave you guys with that. I think we're at the end of our time, so um, let's though continue to discuss this stuff online, and uh, particularly this, um, the issues that people are interested in about sexuality. Ben, any last thoughts? Just one, that in the last paragraph of the chapter, uh, right before what is basically, I think, a mutual climax uh, scene, we get this line. Yes. They had moved by the power of the, they had moved by the power of the thought that one remakes the earth for one's enjoyment. That man's spirit gives meaning to insentient matter by molding it to serve one's one's chosen goal. And I'll just leave that there because it's worth thinking about what kind of parallels there are between the way this line is being described, the sex scene, and the way that it could also be used to describe the running of the John Galt line, which is of course what the chapter is all about where uh, Dagny has been making a number of these identifications about uh, the nature of physical pleasure earlier, but also the fact that, that there's this issue of spirit giving meaning to matter by... Spirit giving uh, um, meaning to matter, I think is a really significant...
significant points, and I think that is the meaning of this chapter and the meaning of the John Galt line. Um, so with that, I think uh, that concludes episode eight, and we look forward to seeing all of you next week, on Halloween, for the sacred and the profane. So uh, perhaps people can come up with clever costumes that capture that <laughs> contrast. Okay, that's it for us. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. <laughs>